Okay, great. So firstly, I want to welcome everybody. Thanks for joining in. And uh, I really appreciate my wife Seema for moderating this, uh, or hosting this session, I must say. And uh, we had over 140 RSVPs. So we do expect to see folks uh, trickling in, but we'll get going because we decided that we'll keep this <coughs> short and sweet. And uh, we, we will wrap it up within an hour, just so that we have enough of a discussion, but uh, we'll probably do a version two of this uh, webcast in a few days, uh, based upon how this goes and the questions and, um, and the conversations that happen here today. So what I will do is uh, I'll just run through, I'll provide a little context to what's going on. You know, we all heard about the shelter in place, so we currently have grocery stores, pharmacies, uh, restaurants for takeout only. We have gas stations, all that kind of stuff. You saw the list that includes like even hardware stores, banks, laundry services, daycares, hospitals. So, so this is uh, right now happening in uh, Santa Clara County and San Mateo County. And I presume many of us are from these uh, two counties. And uh, also, you know, what we are not going to get into is like should have, would have, you know, all that finger pointing because we are here to find constructive solutions and to find answers. And we called it a myth buster. You know, there is a lot of data points that have been thrown out on social media and it can get a little overwhelming and even confusing. So, so that's the reason why we'll keep it uh, very simple we'll uh, talk about uh, the, the main issues on hand and uh, we'll have a good conversation. Now, also I wanted to talk about uh, uh, what's happening today is some very heartwarming stories with uh, neighbors helping each other out. We have launched the Neighborhood uh, Pandemic Preparedness Program and we have had over, I believe 150, 160 signups of people, of neighbors who are wanting to help other neighbors. And uh, we are actually going about uh, meeting with seniors via phone, not face to face, and asking them what their issues are, where they need help. And we have heard, heard some pretty good stories of uh, neighbors helping out a senior neighbor with a grocery bag, or even like coffee beans or anything else they need, just trying to keep them safe. So what I see is there is a little chaos, there is concern, there is anxiety, but amidst that, yeah, I can see a lot of uh, good things happening of uh, neighbors stepping up uh, and supporting each other. And that's really what makes this country amazing. And uh, a high school student today reached out and said they want to build an app and a web page with a very specific idea. And then as I was driving into the office, uh, taking the elevator up, I saw another email of somebody willing to help us out with the grocery and uh, medication distribution or pharmacy uh, distribution that we were attempting to do. So there are lots of people who are stepping up to, to find answers, to be of help. And uh, it's something really good that is happening right now. And in spite of uh, a pandemic that we are all sort of reeling for the very first time uh, that at least in our time that we have seen. So with that, uh, I would love to see how we can get things started. And instead of going through elaborate uh, introductions, why don't we just jump into the questions and we would love to request each of our panelists to, to provide a little backdrop as they feel necessary about themselves. So today on the panel, we have Dr. Prashant Krishnamohan, who's the neurocritical care from Stanford University. We have Dr. Nidhi Gupta, internal medicine at uh, NEMS. We have Dr. Neetu Nebwani, who is the internal medicine physician at Nexus Care. And uh, last but not the least, we have Dr. Anita Kumari, who has actually been instrumental in putting this team together. Uh, she is uh, part of the hematology oncology at the Valley Medical Center. So let's get going with the questions and get the conversation started. So we'll, we'll first run through a few set of questions that I have, and, uh, and then we'll take uh, questions from the audience. So the first uh, 
the question is, uh, you know, we have all been sort of uh, talking about a lack of uh, test kits, which has dominated the conversation for many weeks now. And so my question to Dr. Prashant Krishnamohan is, uh, you know, uh, what, what exactly are the symptoms like and how can we possibly validate if we are unsure whether I have coronavirus or not? Now, there was an online site, uh, the Project Baseline, that was created by, it's a health information platform run by Google subsidiary Very Verily. And uh, so that was rolled out, but uh, it has gotten some pretty, it, it's still in progress because it was a pilot program that was literally rolled out a couple of days back and it's got some uh, kinks to work through. But uh, would love to get some insights from the expert, from Dr. Prashant Krishnamohan, in terms of what are the symptoms like and how can each of us possibly validate uh, the, the uh, health condition that we may have? Of course. Um, you know, in, in terms of symptoms, this is, you know, you probably heard it like a million times on TV already. Um, you know, this is like any other viral illness, you know, what you see with flu or uh, things like that. So, you know, the first thing about 70 to 80 percent of us who get this infection are likely going to have no symptoms or if we do, they're going to be extremely mild. And when I say mild, just maybe mild fever, some dry cough, maybe sore throat. And that's probably what 70 to 80 percent of us are going to experience. Uh, in about 15 percent or so of patients, then you can uh, go on to develop more severe symptoms, which would essentially be um, difficulty breathing. Um, and these are the patients that end up, you know, having to go to the ER and having to get hospitalized. So, you know, for most patients, as I said, the symptoms are going to be just kind of nonspecific fever, body pain, dry cough, sore throat, uh, it can progress on to difficulty breathing, low oxygen levels. And in the extremely severe cases, maybe about 5% or so are the patients that would, the symptoms would be severe enough to where they would need an ICU level care. Uh, and most, almost always the ICU level care is for difficulty with breathing. Um, you know, in terms of testing, um, it's, it's, as you said, it's been kind of, um, uh, most of the confusion, he, you know, so far has been around testing. In an ideal world, we would like to test like pretty much anyone who shows any of these mild symptoms. And, and, and again, there has to be a little bit of context. Now, you know, I'm sure some of the experts are gonna talk about the different spreading, the modes of spread, but in an area like ours in Santa Clara County, where we're talking about community spread, which is basically where people are developing COVID-19 without any clear exposure. They don't know anyone who was on a cruise ship. They don't know anyone who traveled from China. For in an area where we are experiencing community spread, in an ideal world, we would like to test every single one who has like fever or sore throat. But we, you know, unfortunately, we haven't been at that place um, this past couple of months. We may be there in a few weeks as the testing is ramping up. So right now the testing has been limited to patients who have a clear history of contact. Like, you know, they have like a family member or someone who they had direct contact with that tested positive. People who traveled from high risk countries or certain high risk population as we call them, people who have like underlying heart disease, lung disease, and then healthcare workers. So these are the people that are being prioritized. So the chances are, you know, and some of you might have already faced it, if you called your doctor saying, I have mild fever and sore throat, the chances of you being referred for testing was probably low. Now, the situation is changing as a lot of private players and like other places like Stanford are like offering testing in addition to the public health labs. Um, I think we're starting to see more and more people being referred but still almost all of these places need some kind of a physician referral for testing. So if you just walk up to them, say I have cough, cold, I need to be tested, you're more than likely that you're not gonna be offered that testing. So, so Prashant, uh, you know, follow one question is, uh, do you see a, a future like within a week, two weeks, where we have a huge number of uh, tests being conducted? Because right now, I think the talk uh, is that Many of us are infected and, uh, and we don't know it. And just that uh, some of us are resilient and we are able to withstand it. So option A is what South Korea did, 
they pretty much conducted a lot of testing. And option B is what we are doing right now is a shelter in place. We are minimizing the interaction mm -hmm. and we would like to see this uh, curve flatten out. So option A or option B, which, which way do you think the US is going? So I think they're, um, you know, it's probably both and they're slight, addressing slightly different aspects. So the testing capacity is definitely increasing and, you know, a um, lot of private players are coming in and the, we are pro hopefully, again, I'm not a public health expert on this, but just the way things are going, hopefully in a few weeks, you're going to see like, you know, 2,000 to 3,000 tests being done uh, every day. Right now, we're not even at that point. There are places like South Korea who are doing like 20,000 tests a day. So we're definitely ramping up the testing capability. So that will definitely keep happening. And as that happens, we will likely see that the overall number of cases go up. It, that doesn't mean that the disease like the outbreak is getting worse. It just means we're now finding out more and more who is getting infected. But the, the talk about flattening the curve is a slightly different idea. Uh, that is basically, you know, you, we don't want a, a whole lot of people like showing up in the ER all with like breathing trouble and like needing ICU level care, which is gonna flatten, which is gonna like overwhelm the system. So what we are hoping is, you know, by doing the social isolation and shelter in place, we're going to try to slow down whatever spread that we can. And so instead of like, you know, for just for instance, a thousand people get this uh, COVID-19, instead of all thousand getting it within a week, we are hoping that those thousand patients are going to get it over like four weeks time. So that way, you know, by the time like some patients present by week four, the patients who presented by week one have gotten into the hospital, gotten to the ICU, gotten better, left the ICU. So that way we kind of are able to uh, ration our um, limited resources. Yep, that's an excellent point, uh, Prashant. That uh, is actually a good segue to my next question because uh, I still see a lot of postings um, on social media. You know, what's the big deal, guys? This is only a flu, right? And uh, people are still very relaxed. Like we just talked about folks in Florida enjoying a day at the beach. So what's the big deal attitude is what we see with uh, many of these um, uh, folks, uh, especially on social media. So Dr. Neetu Nebwani, the next question is for you. Why should we be all worried about uh, coronavirus? You know, what's, why, why in this case that we really, really need to uh, take some precautions and be a little careful. All right. Um, as we all know that we are in the middle of a coronavirus epidem uh, pandemic, actually, WHO has declared this as a global health emergency and U.S. President Donald Trump has declared this as a national health emergency. There are these, I believe these are reasons enough to be worried. Um, at this point, we have more than 6,000 patients in our country, and we believe that this number is actually not an accurate representation due to the lack of testing. Um, if we look at the curve, our numbers are going exponentially high each and every day, um, and we need to take strict action to flatten that curve. Um, if we don't do that right now, um, the estimated cases in America will be in millions. This is not flu. Um, the mortality rate for flu is 0.3%. An estimated mortality rate for coronavirus or COVID-19 is estimated to be between 1% to 3%, which is a pretty high number. We see about fifty to 60,000 deaths from flu each year in the United States. So you can imagine the number um, with that 1% to 3% of mortality rate. Um, this is serious. We need to really uh, work on flattening the curve uh, and we need to act fast. And what is the big deal attitude needs to change and we can change that by education and awareness and everyone needs to take accountability for that. Um, so let us all, including you know us and including everybody in the community, each one of us, we all need to be a part of the solution and not the problem. Um, and I you know, repeat this, we all need to be a part of the solution and not the problem. This should be the mantra going forward. Um, at this point, we are beyond the containment phase and we are adopting measures to mitigate this epidemic. Um, every single one 
comes and mm-hmm. everybody comes. Uh, we saw what happened. Um, you know, we saw what happened in South Korea. One person started the epidemic in that country. We don't want to be where today Italy and Iran is. Um, and actually, we are not that far. Uh, that's why we need to take these measures uh, rapidly and quickly. Correct. Uh, and Dr. Neetu, you are referring to patient number 31 in South Korea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if, uh, you know, folks on this call haven't uh, quite read up on that. It's very interesting what one person because they thought it was nothing, they ended up uh, essentially creating a huge situation for the whole country. So, so that's, that, that's the reason why I completely agree with, uh, with Neetu that we have to put the brakes on it right now. Mm-hmm. And so, which actually brings me to my next question and uh, which is uh, for Dr. Gupta, Dr. Nidhi Gupta, you know, she's part of the Northeast Medical Services and, uh, you know, we, t- we talked about South Korea, we talked about Italy, but uh, essentially they are two contrast. And uh, so let us start with what are the key lessons from Italy that didn't quite play out very well for them. And I've seen lots of graphs that uh, sort of say that we are on the same, uh, we are trending the same way as Italy. So what can we, the people do to prevent Italy playing out here in the United States? That's very, yeah, that's a very good question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, the, in fact, the coronavirus was first detected in Italy in middle or late Feb, around February 22nd. And right after the first week, uh, we saw an exponential increase in the number of cases. It went from somewhere in a few hundreds to about 21,000 in three weeks. So the crucial thing here to notice is not just a large number of cases, it's just the number of cases that are coming, the sick patients that are coming to the hospital at the same time. So every, every healthcare system, every country has a limited number of beds. Uh, we know we have, so we're watching the number of cases in US, the confirmed cases since uh, beginning of March till now, and you're right, the graphs are showing that we're following the pattern of, the, of Italy um, we, as much as we would like to follow Singapore or Korea or not, we're just following the pattern of Italy. So we've reached a point where we can see either see an exponential increase in the number of cases, which is very likely because we're, we have moderate disease burden, 70% of the population is going to get it. The question is, what can we do um, as a community that people who are actually sick need the hospital care? can get it on time. Um, And that's where the social distancing comes into play. That's where flattening the curve comes into play. What we want to do is we want to limit the spread of the virus in the community today. We don't want to wait until next week. So the number, so about 80% of the patients recover. They might need, 20% of the patients might require hospitalization and under 5% might require an ICU bed. So if we do the math, what we want to, and we know the number of beds in the United States, ICU beds is about 200,000. And so what we want to do is we want to stagger the number of people who are coming on a daily basis at these hospitals and requiring intensive care, that they don't show up all at the same time. We want to stagger that over months. So that's what happened in Italy, that you know the healthcare system broke down until you know, the president had to call the national shutdown as of March 9. What we don't want, we don't want the same thing here. We want to just limit the spread of the virus in the community. It is a big deal. And uh, the, the healthy people, we can be vectors, we're asymptomatic, we have milder disease. It is a big deal for the rest of us who are taking care of the sicker patients in the hospital that we don't want to see a large number of cases on the same day. So social distancing is serious, we should, uh, we should really do it. Absolutely agree with that. So, so Nidhi, uh, you know, we read about washing hands with soap. We also read about mask and gloves. And unfortunately, you know, soap is something we typically have at home. Yeah. But we are struggling with masks and gloves. So what are our options when we go to the grocery shopping or to the pharmacy or any, any, any suggestions on what else we could be doing? 
That's a very practical question. And um, the important thing here I would remind people is how the infection is actually spread. It spreads through respiratory droplets. And these droplets fall on surfaces and the, the virus is viable in those droplets for several hours to several days. And when someone comes in contact with those droplets, touches your face, that's the point of entry. We all know that. Knowing that, when you do go to the grocery store and you don't have disposable gloves, you don't, really don't need masks because if you maintain the social distancing, which is six feet, really, so um, if you maintain that six feet of distance between people, um, you don't touch your hands to your face. You don't, bring, you don't bring it to your mouth, your eyes and your nose. It's like, it's called don't touch men. M is for mouth, I is for, e is for eyes and N is for nose. If you don't touch that, and even when you're in the line, you maintain the same six feet of distance when you're paying and you come home and you wash your hands, that will definitely limit or reduce your risk of infection. I have seen some creative things that people have been doing. They're using, uh, they're reusable, the, the gloves that you, know, you would use for in, in uh, colder weather and you can certainly disinfect them when you bring them home. Uh, people are using trash bags and then disposing them off. Um, a lot of grocery stores are offering disinfecting wipes. So definitely use that for those, for the handles. So social distancing is the way to go. Uh, maintain six feet when you're at the store, don't touch your face, wash your hands immediately. A lot of people come back from the stores and tell me they just take a shower and just, you know, get their clothes in the washer right away. As long as you maintain, you know, your hand hygiene throughout. There are things you can do. I hope I provided some solutions. Yes, yes, Nidhi, those are very good practical solutions, so thank you. And uh, let's, let's go to Dr. Anita Kumari, uh, who's part of the Valley Medical Center. And so we were talking about myth best busters. So here is one, and I've seen lots of uh, social media postings on this one, and they are very colorful and they are laid out in gory details. And uh, what they talk about is that coronavirus stays in the throat for four days, the person experiencing cough and throat pains before reaching the lungs. So goggling with warm water and salt vinegar helps. So, and then I've heard other contrary, contrary opinions to this. So, so Anita, what's your take on this? You're on mute, Anita. Well, thank you, Mr. Rishi Kumar and Seema for doing this for all of us and for the, everybody who's attending this. Uh, so my take on, you know, the, what uh, the gargling with salt and water, there is no data behind it as much as I can see. So the, I think what you're saying is how can we limit the transmission of the virus? Is that the, the real question here? Like how can we, even if it is attacks your throat, how can you make sure that it does not probably infect you. So um, it's, so, it's so all it, drop. It, okay. it, let, me, let me clarify, right? So essentially yeah. what we're talking about is, you know, what is something that we could do to, to prevent this from, from triggering in our system? Let's say it's in our throat or, or, you know, what can we do? Like we talked about goggling with warm water or drinking hot turmeric milk, you know, I mean, what are the different options we have to, to prevent this from really kicking in into our system? Uh, I, I think Nidhi is going to address that question. So sure. go ahead, Nidhi. So what you mentioned about gargling with warm water and vinegar is what, what's happening there. It helps people do that when they have a common cold and influenza and they feel better. What they're really doing there is reducing the viral load in your mucosa at the time. Uh, but what really is fighting the infection is your immune system. So what you can do is really make sure your immune system is strong and how you do that is maintaining a healthy lifestyle, exercise, plenty of water and eating nutritious food. A lot of people ask, are there any supplements that can be taken? I mean, CDC, there's no, there's no uh, recommendations as such, but in general, what we advise people is taking high doses of vitamin C, uh, there's zinc, and then you know, for kids, vitamin D, those are just general supplements that keep your immune system pretty robust. And 
if you do catch an infection, that's, you know, if you're young and healthy, that will just boost your immune system to um, prevent from a se uh, more serious sickness. Got it. Okay. So, so essentially, we are talking about taking vitamin C, eating a lot of fruits, uh, orange juice, perhaps, <laughs> and uh, taking echinacea can... and, and just the usual stuff that we do over the winter, right? Keep your immune system. Have been, yeah, there have been some reports from the you know, experience in China that uh, vitamin C in the very high dose is three to six grams a day for adults. And I think one gram twice a day for kids is the, some data uh, that it does help with the immunity with COVID-19. Uh, but as far as the gargling, you know, it's just, there's no, no data. Basically the transmission, we just need to stop the transmission of the virus and probably uh, social distancing with six feet. Right now we know that the, everything is 90% of the time, it's probably transmission is droplet and that's where we have to intervene. Keeping that social distancing six feet or more Whenever you are coughing, sneezing, do not touch your men as Nidhi already mentioned, mouth, ear, eyes, and nose. You know, that should be avoided. Or any mucous membrane. Uh, that's, that's the main way of transmission of this uh, disease. Uh, there is some data, it's still, you know, the understanding is still incomplete. There is some data that it could be airborne, but we are still, you know, trying to find out. Right now, all the data is anybody who's healthy should not be using masks. It's uh, highly recommended even by CDC. There is no reason why anybody should be using masks. Basic hygiene with diligent hand washing with 20 seconds or more. So I actually tell my son to count from A, B, C to Z. That is more than 20 seconds. So they should be doing that very diligently. Because this is a fat soluble, the extra, uh, the layer of the virus is fat soluble. So it would not be removed by just water. There was some question somebody asked me, in the rain, the virus should be drained, right? Because it's raining. So, no, if, if that was so, we'll just be washing our hands with water and it will go. So, they, it's very important we should do hand washing with soap uh, or sanitizing with 60% or more of alcohol. These are the two things that we know the hand washing will remove the virus from the, like grease from any, you know, any utensil. The 60% or more of the alcohol probably will kill the virus. The two ways that we can prevent this transmission. And this is the most important thing for community. So I, I, that's just my two cents. Excellent. Th these are really, really good advice. And, uh, you know, we're talking about myth busters. I've read something about uh, Tylenol or Advil. And uh, so my next question is to back to Neetu. You know, as per findings from Italy and South Korea, uh, we should avoid ibuprofen as a fever reducer as it may aggravate coronavirus. So what's your recommendation on that, Neetu? So I'm just going to provide you some context on that first. There's actually a new article that came in one of the journals today. Um, it's an article stating and quoting different um, uh, physicians all over the world as to what their opinion is. And I'm going to give you some of those uh, quotes, and then I'm going to tell you what my recommendation is. So what they're saying is this all started when... Um, French Health Minister Oliver Veron tweeted on Saturday 14th, March, um, that people with suspected COVID-19 should avoid anti-inflammatory drugs, taking, for example, ibuprofen, which could be aggravating factors for the infection. If you have fever, take paracetamol, for which in the US we do acetaminophen or Tylenol. Ian Jones, a professor of virology at University of Reading, said that ibuprofen's anti-inflammatory properties could dampen the immune system, which could slow the recovery process. And again, this is the time we need our immune system to be robust. Um, Charlotte Warren Gosh, Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and, and Tropical Medicine said we need more research into looking into the effects of specific NSAIDs among people with different underlying health conditions. And in the meantime, their recommendation is to use paracetamol or acetaminophen as the first choice. Um, you know, NHS uh, in UK has changed, also updated their recommendations to the public saying that um, if you have, um, so there is currently no strong evidence that ibuprofen can make COVID-19 worse, but until we have more information, take paracetamol or acetaminophen to treat symptoms of coronavirus. And if you're already taking it, don't stop it without talking to your doctor. 
Um, currently, we have no documented evidence or any studies that prove that taking ibuprofen or any non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can worsen coronavirus symptoms or aggravate the infection. Having said that, we know that this is a novel virus. We don't know much about this, and every day we are learning new facts about it. Um, at this time, I think we should consider every information that we are receiving from different parts of the world who are also dealing with the same epidemic as we are and use it to our benefit. And you know, my humble opinion or recommendation would be, and I would actually invite all the other panelists to pitch into this because this is you know, uh, something that everybody has a different opinion on. Um, if you have mild symptoms and or fever, please choose Tylenol as your first choice. Uh, people who are already taking NSAIDs or ibuprofen should not stop them without talking to their physician. So that would be my humble opinion on that. Okay, and does anyone want to debate that uh, on the panel? There are, there are plenty of specialists that are debating at UCSF. There's yeah. more, you know, as more data comes in, we'll have more evidence to support our recommendations. What we're telling people, if you're already on one of these drugs, ACE inhibitors or ARBs and other drugs, you don't have to stop it. Right. You don't want to stop it. And if you're taking uh, ibuprofen because you have severe rheumatoid arthritis or other conditions, you don't want to stop it. Consult your doctor. There's no uh, consensus in the medical community, community yet. But yes, if you do develop a fever, the first thing you want to reach for is Tylenol. Yep. Good, good. I, li I like that. So, so now that brings me to, you know, we started talking about some of the issues that we have had with CDC and also in terms of, uh, you know, this little confusion with Tylenol, Advil. So it seems to me that uh, we haven't quite really dug into this problem and we are still fig figuring out the solution. The vaccination is currently in the works, which might take a year and a half is what I hear typically to go through the process. But in the meantime, you know, I think there are a lot of studies that are to be conducted. So my question is, you know, are we really, do we have a good handle over this or we should see some greater, better insights over the next uh, few weeks or months perhaps where uh, by next winter, you know, we are actually really ready to, to handle this uh, pandemic if, in case it comes back again. So, you know, I mean, are, are, do we have all the data we need right now or we are still kind of grappling with this problem? And uh, let, let's start with uh, Anita. I think you're on mute, Anita. Tell me again, what was the question? I'm sorry. So, so the question is, you know, do we have all the data related to coronavirus for us to do a great job of handling this? Or we are still kind of like uh, struggling in the dark a little bit. You know, we have a few clues here and there, but we still don't have the broad gamut of information as to what it takes for us to combat it? Sure. I, yes, I, I think we are still struggling with the information. And every day we are getting such new information that we are basically readjusting our knowledge as well. So initially, as I said, and but most of the time, the common things always happen most commonly. So droplet, in, even the you know, information about the droplet, we know this was completely dropped, but now there is some data, it could be airborne for at least three hours. There is some data, it could be fecal oral as well, because some patients are having diarrhea. So it's, it's, and it, transmission is so important, because if we don't know how it is transmitted, how do we know how to protect ourselves? So it just keeps on carrying from one patient to other. Now we have data, there might be two or three babies born, so vertical transmissions also happen through placenta. It's just, it's this virus, we have to all understand, medically we are being challenged because this virus has been in this human community for three months only. To understand the whole epidemiology of any kind of virus or bacteria, we need time. It's everything, you know, under, this understanding will happen probably, I'm suspecting it will be probably in the next one or two years, we'll have better understanding about all the general questions people might have. Right now it's all, uh, we just modulate our understanding and our knowledge to the best of what we have right now. That makes sense, that makes sense, Anita. So, you know, what we'll do is, we'll, let's get to the Q&A section and we'll allow our, uh, our audience to basically pose their questions. 
Uh, we would like to say, uh, sort of explain how this will go. We are not going to entertain questions about uh, the personal clinic hospitals, where our panelists are from, and stats, et cetera, that pertain to, to their professional areas, what they are seeing. So we won't talk about that. And, and also, we are not going to give any clinical advice to callers because uh, we want to keep the conversation fairly uh, generic, uh, general in nature, and uh, very similar to the types of questions that we were currently going through. And uh, so no individual clinical advice. So who wants to go first? I can see a lot of questions here that have been posed, but uh, why don't you guys uh, unmute yourself and just uh, talk about uh, what's, what's your ask? Hi, my name is Linda Diamond, <clears throat> and I have two questions. One is, what is the status of compassionate use of drugs such as remdesivir or some of the other treatments that they're starting to look at and places are using um, in compassionate use situations? I can answer that. And then Prashant, I would love your input on that too. Um, hi, Linda. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, when we talk about drugs for the treatment of coronavirus, we want you to know that the initial, that there is no known treatment yet. It's still, the drug is still in trial. And we want to use these drugs if you are developing severe disease. And hospitals have protocols that have been established by CDC. And the, the main reason why you land in a hospital is a bilateral kind of a pneumonia affecting both of your lungs. And, and we have other kinds of drugs that help you come out of that condition. And if, if the symptoms progress, if, you know, there are other antiviral drugs that are being used per protocol, uh, along with remdesivir. Um, there, are, there are, when you come to that point, when a patient comes to that point, uh, every hospital has a liaison um, that coordinates the compassionate use of remdesivir, um, they have come out and said that they will continue to increase the production. Um, but uh, I can't speak of individual hospital. Um, again, it's used only for very severe cases. Prashant, you want to add on to that? Yeah, no. Uh, there are hospitals pretty much across the country that are using remdesivir on compassionate use. Um, you know, the company has been uh, pretty cooperative and they've been like overnighting the medication. So there are a lot of people uh, I believe are using it, but not for everyone. It's, it's really used in people who are really sick and sick meaning people who are like in, you know, having like low oxygen and kind of what we call like respiratory failure uh, stage. Those are the patients we are using them on. So remdesivir and um, there are one other medicine called hydroxychloroquine or commonly called plaquenil which is being, um, you know, people have used it in the past for a variety of reasons. Uh, those are a couple of medicines that are being used. Again, none of these are specifically approved for this condition, uh, as we know, because this has been out, you know, we knew that this virus existed only like as of three months ago, so it's going to take a while for us to uh, get anything approved. Uh, but there are clinical trials that are actively happening right now, uh, especially using remdesivir to see if this would actually be truly effective. So while we are using this on an anecdotal basis, meaning if I use it on like one patient in one hospital and if I find it it's useful, then I'm going to be biased and I'm going to keep using it for every single patient. Whether or not it truly helps, you know, in this condition, you can only find that out in, a, in the setting of a clinical trial. Uh, but yes, we are, you know, hospitals are using remdesivir um, on a compassionate use um, um, it's a very toxic right drug. Now. It does have severe side effects too. So really want to limit the use for very sick patients. Um, my second question was about pregnant women. Um, someone, for example, in their last trimester <clears throat> and two parts to that. Should they go to a hospital to give birth <laughs> as opposed to yeah. being at home or um, and then what do we know, if anything, about the date increased risk 
in pregnancy to the woman as well as to the child? Uh, we have limited information. I mean, uh, based on the information that came from China, among the young people, pregnant women did have a more severe uh, type of disease. Um, uh, so that's the answer to your second part. The first part, whether you should go to the hospital, I think that should be coordinated in consultation with your uh, gynecologist, your obstetrician, because there's more, not just coronavirus, there's other factors, you know, what's your medical history related to your pregnancy um, that might be carry a higher risk uh, for you to be in the hospital for your delivery. So this really should be a question for your gynecologist or your obstetrician who can uh, assess how they are uh, carrying out the deliveries and on a case by case basis. And, uh, they have some reports, uh, you know, from China that uh, they actually two reports that we have from China, a very small number of patients, pregnant patients, but they have already symptomatic. So they have pneumonia and they were tested positive for COVID. So yes, and they some placental transfer as well, but the neonate was positive, but they were not symptomatic. So, but it's all again, new novel for all of us as well. So we are learning as it goes, but if they are symptomatic, they should definitely go to a hospital to get the delivery done. Probably that, but again, an OBGYN question. So, okay, let's go to the next question. And uh, Mike Ziegel, uh, Mike, you're still on. You know, I yes. yeah. Hi, thank you, Rishi. Yes, my daughter's uh, been ordered to go home from her study abroad program in the UK. She's flying home tomorrow night. Per U.S. guidelines, she's told to self quarantine for 14. <clears throat> excuse me, 14 days. Uh, there's three other adults in the house, 18 years old and 62, 62 years old, no pre-existing at-risk conditions. Uh, what kind, how much isolation should we have from her and her from us within the house? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll take that answer. So, um, um, hi, Mike. Thank you hi. for the question. Um, you do have 60 year olds in the house and we have seen the risk of more severe disease starts increasing at the age of 50 and, it, and it's really up when you're 70. So that is a risk factor. Home isolation guidelines, uh, according to CDC, uh, when you're coming back from a travel um, are uh, frequent hand washing, um, cleaning the high touch surface areas multiple times during the day. And people, again, the same thing, you should not be touching your face, avoid touching. And I would uh, recommend if you're able to provide an area, you know, a personal, you, a personal bedroom and a bathroom for your daughter for over the next 14 days, um, if, if ideally that would be, you know, I would do if it was my family and, um, I would not share the food. I would not, uh, I would clean the utensils and, you know, hot water. Um, what else would I, uh, yeah. So I would. Not sharing the utensils, uh, is also recommended in that situation. Um, so, um, um, Providing, uh, yeah, so pretty much if you can, if you can provide a separate bedroom and bathroom over the next 14 days for your daughter, that would be the ideal thing to do. Okay, all right, thank you. Sure. Okay, next question, uh, I can see Karagia Komazi. I don't know if I'm uh, saying it correctly, is, uh, and. Uh, oh yes, it's, it's Cara Giacomazzi, but really Cara Fernandez for those that know me. Um, so my, my concern was earlier on, we were talking about just kind of mobilizing to save everybody in our community. And it just dawned on me when I was at Safeway the other day before the ban or the shelter in place, the cashiers are just, they're so vulnerable. Um, they were wearing gloves, but I wondered if we could like ask around our community to get some masks for them. I know they're healthy, but they're just so vulnerable. I just wondered what the doctors thought about them just being there in one place and not having the the uh, advantages. The That's space. one compassionate uh, person we have in the audience. Thank you so much for, you know, uh, considering uh, what they're doing because they are 
running the stores and we were able to get our essentials because of these cashiers and people who are working in the food industry. Um, I think it's a, it's a great idea. Any, I mean, it's not recommended to, CDC has not given recommendation to wear masks in the public. And, um, but uh, you have a point, you know, they are in very close contact within six feet with number of people throughout the day. And if you, if as a community, we are able to provide that for our cashiers, I think that's a brilliant idea. I think that's very well, there, there was someone on next door that had offered to sew them. And so I wondered your opinion on that. I told her I would ask tonight if that is worth her time or if we should spend more time trying to find someone that has a stash somewhere. So, so uh, I will add just two more things here. Uh, just one, one, if they are young, healthy adults and not symptomatic, they should be okay. Actually, masks not used in the right way is more harmful than masks used. Uh, so I will give you an example. My, I gave my 10-year-old son a mask to use when he was going to school, and it was been under his nose. So it's basically, you know, it's just, it needs to be used in the right way. But if they are not immunocompromised, they are not elderly, they are not symptomatic, it should be okay to just use you know, the basic hand hygiene, the soap, what. Uh, when they go back, they should be, you know, basically having a whole bath and clothes, whatever we have recommended so far. CDC is actually saying we should not be using masks, and that's where the, the holding of masks, the, the shortage of masks in the hospital. Give you an example, my mask for every patient I saw, where even if they were symptomatic, they are not COVID, but they are still coughing, and, you know, everybody's coughing this time. I had to use three masks for the whole day for 15 patients. So if we start doing it, for you know, things that we are not sure of and against CDC, we will see shortage in where we really need it. So that's where we have to be very mindful of what we are doing. And again, piggy bank on Anita's uh, comment, like you know, we are trying to, uh, we are recommending patients to uh, people to not actually touch their mouth. Uh, ears and you know eyes and 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 uh, nose and when you wear a mask you're actually more likely to do that so I think it's counterintuitive so you know as, as Anita said we have to be careful in who we recommend this and there's a lot of shortage for healthcare workers in the United States for you know to get these uh, protective equipment so we just have to be mindful of that so so I, Great, I'm going to jump in and just add a little bit to this because uh, you know, as a high-tech guy, we are always looking to solve problems in Silicon Valley. And this pandemic is actually exposing quite a bit of uh, different facets of problems from different perspectives. And one of which is uh, hoarding. And uh, we have had people who, and you know, I, I don't blame them for it. There is anxiety that builds up and then you go out there and you shop. And, and then you know, the guilt sets in that, oh my God, you know, what did I do, right? So I, I think there's an opportunity which will, uh, which will play out in the next uh, few months where we'll have applications that will be built out perhaps on Nextdoor or perhaps through other avenues of how we're going to redistribute some of these, uh, uh, you know, if I, for lack of a better word, the hoarders, you know, how do we redistribute <laughs> that? And, and so this is something that one of my interns wanted to actually work on this to allow people the opportunity to, to give this back to the neighbors and connect the needy with the ones who have it, you know. So I think these are applications that will get built over time, but more importantly, I think we'll reset. We'll, uh, we sort of have never seen this situation before. And we went a little bit crazy with uh, trying to overreact, I should say. And, and then uh, I think it, in case we see this one, one, the next time, we'll be a little bit more prepared and we will not repeat the mistakes that we have done in the past. So obviously there's a, the playbook will be written based upon how this all plays out for us over the next few weeks and we'll be so much better off uh, after that. So which brings me, we only have about uh, 10 minutes left in our panel here. So let's uh, go to the final wrap up. And uh, I would love to just have uh, each of you talk a little bit about uh, sort of like your final words in terms of you know, any, any piece of advice you would like to leave our audience with? Uh, we actually hit the 100 number. And I, I guess a lot of people were not able to get into the call because we had a maximum limit of 100. So uh, we'll, we'll probably do this again, but this video will be posted on YouTube and we'll send it out to our, our folks who had RSVP. So the question is, 
you know, how do you see the future of this playing out? You know, is it a doom and gloom scenario playing out? Or do you see things to sort of correct itself and come together in the next uh, three weeks? Given the fact that we have shelter in place, we see some good outcomes out of this, but uh, love to have each of you just go around and very briefly talk about, you know, what's any, any final piece of advice or what does the future look like in case of a pandemic like this? I can start off. So, you know, I think we will get through this. Um, it, it, it's it's going to be uh, quite a process and there's going to be um, a lot of developments, but eventually we're going to turn back and say, hopefully say, well, uh, you know, if we are doing all the right things, hopefully we'll be saying, thank God it wasn't as bad as we thought, but we won't know until we kind of get to the uh, other end. Uh, you know, in terms of piece of advice, you know, we're doing a lot of this not to make the general public panic, really all, you know, there's really no reason to panic. You know, if a really, really sick COVID-19 patient shows to any U.S. hospital, they will be taken really good care of. Our health system, you know, for all this conversations online about our system was like, caught flat-footed, like we didn't respond very well. I think the only parts of it is true. We can really take good care of these patients and get them through. What we don't want to happen is like the system getting overwhelmed with like, you know, when we put the shelter in place, people were standing outside Safeway and like Trader Joe's in long lines. Imagine something like that happening in a hospital with like everyone like really sick with COVID-19. And that's really what we don't want to see because then the system gets overwhelmed. But if the patients kind of come in a steady stream, no matter how sick they are, we can take good care of them. So all everything that the public health officials and CDC is trying to do is kind of asking people to do like the right thing, the sensible thing, but there's absolutely no reason to panic. Like there's no reason to hoard. Like, you know, it's not that 70% of the US population is gonna die because of COVID-19. The mortality is like one to 2%, even though it's a lot, it's still like, the vast majority of us are going to just get through this fine. But I think we all need to play our part in preventing the spread. And that's where all of the measures are aimed at. So no reason to panic, but probably everyone needs to do their part to kind of prevent the spread. Yes, what I'm hearing is uh, overtaxing our systems that we have today. And that's why it's imperative that uh, we don't fall sick. And the shelter in home will definitely help with that. But also in case we fall sick, that doesn't mean just because we have a cough and a cold doesn't mean that uh, we have uh, the coronavirus. So there's no need to be paranoid. Let's all be a little pragmatic in terms of how we operate and we'll get out through this okay. So let's uh, go to uh, Dr. Nidhi Gupta. Um, I completely echo with Prashant's uh, viewpoint and I think um, we have enough educated people here and if everyone does their role in social distancing and we can stagger the cases that are coming to for acute care i mean what you said just because we have cough and cold doesn't mean we have the coronavirus even if we have coronavirus doesn't mean we need to go to the hospital we might just recover just fine from it at home so um that's an important thing to remember in terms of the future of the coronavirus, coronaviruses, uh, we have had so many of them. We had SARS, we have MERS. They, they have been hard to tackle. We still haven't come up with any vaccine or any ways of curing the sickness. Uh, but what historically we have done is figure out how they spread and kind of uh, contain them. So. We'll see how this coronavirus life cycle, you know, evolves after this fall, whether it comes up again. So time will tell. Um, there are people who are developing a lot of vaccines and let's hope if, if it turns up again, we have some solution. Um, as a community, I would urge everyone to take social distancing seriously. We should not point fingers at others. We should educate each other, our kids, you know, when they go to the parks, um, we are recommending avoiding the playgrounds because there's no disinfection going on over the, over the playgrounds. Um, maintain the social, especially the teens. I've, I'm getting a lot of uh, uh, questions from, from the parents of millennials that they're having a hard time staying at home. 
um, you know, if they can do their part, then we can do our part of taking care of these patients when, when they come to the hospital. Yep, yeah, it's, it's ha it has to be a team sport, is what I'm hearing, Nidhi. So the question is, uh, you know, back to you, Nidhi, is I, I hear that this particular strain is very resilient and uh, it, it may come back after uh, next winter. What's your take on that, you know? We don't know. We don't know. We had the SARS and the MERS outbreak, um, SARS in 2003 and 2004, and then later on MERS, and they've kind of died down and they're, they're stayed locally in the areas where they started. So um, I, I just don't know whether once, you know, once the summer is here and typically the viruses do not survive in high temperature. Oops, I said that. But, <laughs> but we don't know um, if, if it is going to mutate and become more infectious, more virulent. Uh, the, the scientists are, there are several research centers who are trying to find that answer. Uh, I'm waiting for that too. I don't know. Okay, okay. So that's uh, <laughs> like a medical uh, profession. Yeah, go ahead, Anita. Yeah. To these points, even if the virus, so suspecting if the virus comes back, because I'm, I have read somewhere it's one person mutation per day. So it may come back again next fall, but we'll be better prepared. We people will be more educated. We may have vaccine probably next year or next to next year. We may have treatments available. It's just this year, the flattening the curve is so, so, so important. And we need everybody to be aware, to know what we need to do for flattening the curve so that the healthcare does not have to get overwhelmed with what happened in Italy, what happened in other places, China. You know, we want to just get that very, very, and that's why the educational sessions are very important. And let's take. Agree totally, totally, Anita. So Neetu, um, let's, let's hear it from you. Yeah, so this is a fluid situation as we all know and it's very hard to know what the future is going to be and what we can think about is what we can do as healthcare professional, as a community to flatten the curve. I think that's the key to contain this and that's the key to basically decrease the impact of this epidemic. So, you know, social isolation, um, shelter in place, these are great measures and I would urge each and everybody in the community to do their part. And again, I probably am repeating myself, let's all be a part of the solution and not the problem. So, you know, let's all do our part to make this better. Well, well said, well said, Neetu, you know, like we started when we first started this conversation, we said, let's not do the finger pointing, but let's figure out, you know, how we can all collaborate, move forward and uh, just sort of get through this as quickly as possible and go back to normalcy of life. You know, our kids are all talking about when can life get back to normal, but uh, you know, it's a pandemic and we have to sort of deal with it and get out quickly uh, as, as fast as we can. So, so uh, you know, I, I wanted to thank the, the panelists, all of you uh, for taking the time to join us. I know you have done a few of these and uh, you're also you know, having a pretty busy day back at work and then it's like, the, the evening time, you're supposed to be relaxing, getting ready for perhaps going back to work again tomorrow, but you are taking the time to join us. So I really appreciate the time that you have spent. Very informative for me and uh, hopefully for everyone else on this call. And uh, my apologies to the folks who couldn't join it, but we'll do a take two, a version two of this one in a, in a couple of days and we'll figure out dates and times and we'll revert back uh, with, with a new meeting just like this. But we'll dig in a slightly, little bit more deeper and uh, take, take that version two of this conversation. So, so let's, uh, let's see how we can make that happen. Uh, thank you to all for joining in today and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you, bye. Sounds good, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.